Good morning. Today is March the 5th, 2005, and this tape is one of a series of interviews of North Fork Women for the Archives Committee of the North Fork Women for Women Fund. I'm Susan Forbes, and I'm here with Sandra Sinclair, and we're visiting Marianne Weil, a professional artist and sculptor whose work is in numerous private collections. She's shown in many group exhi exhibitions, as well as having solo exhibits in New Hampshire, Massachusetts, Kentucky, and New York City. Marianne's awards and honors include residencies in Italy, Canada, Hawaii, Indiana, Montana, Scotland, and Iceland. Good morning, Marianne. Can you tell us a little bit about some of the influences or some of the uh, inspirations that your work has uh, reflected? I'd love to. I'd love to. Um, over the past 10 years, I've spent a lot of time visiting different sites in uh, mostly uh, Northern Europe. Ten years ago, what initiated the um, study of Neolithic sites was a stay in Normandy, and I visited some sites in Carnac, the Isle of Gavrini, um, in Brittany, to look at uh, menhirs and megaliths there. And that inspired some of the first uh, friezes or wall reliefs that are up on, on uh, the wall of the studio here. Some of the freestanding pieces in, this, in the hallway of the studio are, uh, were, are developed from a residency that I had in Scotland some years ago, in uh, Arbroath, Scotland. And I went to uh, the Orkney Islands where I visited the Stones of Stennis and the Brockney, the Circle in Brockney. And, um, and many of these pieces have been inspired subsequently from 2001. Was the, the group of works that you're looking at. These were originally made in wax, and I used the lost wax process where I make an original in wax, develop the wax piece, a model for it, then enlarge it, and then uh, cast it in bronze. So they're all one of a kind. Occasionally I make an addition where I make a mold of a, a piece, but uh, most of these are developed working directly in wax. They're thin walls, quarter inch, that are made in wax and then whatever you have in wax is, is uh, uh, translated into the bronze. Frequently I use my hands as you can see in this piece the impression of my fingers is uh, drawn into the wax. I use a lot of uh, steel tools over a flame to model the, the wax. Okay, Marianne. Um, tell us a little bit about how you happened to start with working in bronze. Well, that's a long story. You want to hear the whole story? Sure. <laughs> I, uh, I cast my first bronze sculpture in 1976. Uh, I should backtrack a little. I actually, um, uh, in college, I went to Goddard College in Vermont. And uh, I was very fortunate to work with a British sculptor, Peter Ruddick, who uh, uh, built a, a small foundry at, this, at the college and introduced me to casting. While I was at Goddard, I also, this was back uh, in the early 70s, from 1972 to 74, I was a student there. And uh, while I was a student at Goddard, I apprenticed a couple of Italian stone carvers in Barrie, Vermont. And uh, some of the work I did is in front of us. I pulled out a couple of photographs to document the process of reproducing uh, classical stone sculpture. This is um, Aphrodite de Melos, a Greek piece, a, re a reproduction in plaster. And what I learned with the Italian carvers in Barry was how to reproduce uh, from a plaster model a stone carving. And this is a uh, Vermont marble with a When I arrived in Italy in February of 1974, I uh, continued to learn this tradition with a pointing machine that uh, reproduces a plaster model into uh, a stone carving. And after I spent about six months doing that, I made my own models in clay and made molds into uh, plaster, and copied my own sculpture, uh, working under the tutelage of, of artisans also in Pietrasanta. Originally, I was uh, introduced 
formally with a letter of introduction by the two Italian carvers from Barry to go to Carrara. And the reason why I was headed for Carrara was because that was the site of the quarries where Michelangelo quarried his stone from the mountains above the town. I arrived in Carrara and I thought it was just too industrial, too large a town, and it was very important for me to have some kind of uh, a connection to a community, the intimacy of working with other artists like myself who were interested in, in the tradition of stone carving. So, um, like Goddard, with the small community, I was looking to continue uh, uh, creating uh, a connection with, with my peers and, and studying art. And while you were in Pietrasanta, did you find an American community there at all? <coughs> not only speaking, Americans. Were you speaking fluent Italian not, at not, that point? Uh, not immediately, but there were not only Americans, there were Japanese. You can see in this photograph that I pulled out, uh, this is one of the first pieces that I, I carved. It's not marble, it's a stone called tufo, multicolored stone. Actually, I still have, that's one of the few stone carvings I do have. It's uh, in my hallway over there. We can take a look at that later. But uh, this guy is a, a Japanese sculptor. There were a lot of Germans and French and British. Uh, and the, the language, uh, of learning Italian, I spoke French when I first went to Italy. And as I dropped a word of French, I picked up a word of Italian. And uh, after about six months, I was pretty fluent in Italian. I made a lot of friends, and I worked in Italian studios. This is a one of these photographs, this is Sergio, who was a, a great mentor uh, artisan who taught me a lot about stone carving. And um, I, stayed, I stayed in Pietra Santa eight months before I returned to the States, and then I graduated at, from Goddard in December of 1974. And that's when you received your Bachelor of Arts degree, mm -hmm. and then eventually you're going to go on to continue your studies at the School of Visual Arts. Not for and 10 years. <clears throat> right. Right. Not for 10 years. And but you're pursuing a master's degree as well. And is that specifically in bronze sculpture? Well, frankly, I didn't want to go to graduate school. I didn't think I wanted to teach right after um, graduating. I thought uh, that would be my demise as an artist, that if I went off and got my certification to teach or focused on a graduate degree, I wouldn't have the support and a foundation that I really needed to sustain my work. And I think frequently I had uh, sort of uh, models in my life where people went and ended up teaching art rather than pursuing their, their dream or love or passion. And were you creating. able to, to show at this time? Were you exhibiting yes. um, and able to, to it was, uh, it was very have important income from being well, a fine a, artist? Well, a small income. I had a couple of small commissions. One of the first commissions I had was to do a monument. A classmate of mine at Goddard, his mother had died, and I did a, a small bronze monument for his mom that went down to uh, Richmond, Virginia. And um, I exhibited. Uh, part of the requirements at Goddard was that you had a, a solo show before graduating, and then I continued. I had another solo show in uh, northern Westchester in the winter of 75. But after that, I was in Italy for, for quite a while and showed in Europe. I continued uh, to, to travel while I was working in Pietra Santa, and I had a solo show in 1979 in Zurich. I uh, showed um, at the uh, U.S. consulate in Milan in 1978. So I was always trying to pursue that path to get the work out there, make, make new work, and uh, continue to show. Mm -hmm. And then how, in this wonderful career that you've had, how do you end up finally in the North Fork, and specifically here in Orient? Well, um, in 1976, when I was living in Pietra Santa, I, I had a nice little apartment, two-room apartment, which uh, I should say cost me $40 a month to live in, in uh, Pietra Santa. So I was able to live on just a few thousand dollars a year to build this uh, body of work, build the body of work, and also give myself a foundation in in sculpture with all the essential techniques that I, I really didn't think in college I could learn everything I needed to, to know. So um, 
1976, I was working at a marble studio, the Pala Art Studio in Pietrasanta, and also the Mariani Bronze Foundry. And lo and behold, Dorothy Abbott, um, a sculptor 20 years my senior, was working at the same two studios. And we, we met briefly, and then we were introduced more formally by um, a father, a minister, not a minister, priest. a priest, thank you, Roman Catholic priest who uh, was from New York and was fortunate enough to have uh, marble training and carved stone monuments for the church. And Pad Padre Tom, Father Tom, introduced us and uh, we had dinner together and connected and uh, became lovers. This is in 1976 and uh, when I came back to the States to visit Dorothy in the winter of 76, she uh, had already been living here for many years. Uh, Dorothy, Dorothy, Dorothy grew up, Dorothy on the grew up summers in Jamesport and um, when I met her, she had a small house, what's called Bluefish Cove in East Marion, and it wasn't winterized, and we came back, uh, sort of jumping around a little, but we came back and we winterized her house, and in by 1978, we were able to, to live there year-round, although I was still working in Italy. But it gave us, and it enabled us uh, to have a place here to, to live in year-round. And how did you feel? I mean, was that sort of unusual for you coming into this uh, small community of women here on the North Fork? Well, aside from coming into, I mean, I wasn't even thinking about it as a lesbian community. I was thinking Long Island. I always thought I was going to go back to Vermont to live, you know, after working in Italy. I always thought I'd find a barn in Vermont and uh, nest up there. And when Dorothy invited me out to Kutchog, I had never been to even Brooklyn. <laughs> I grew up in Manhattan. So coming out all the way out here, I got off the train in Kutchog in the middle of a farm field. I never thought there was a bit of New England on Long Island. And uh, I was fascinated with the area. As so many other women, I think, are. They're just surprised that it's, it, it appears to be a, a rather rural landscape. And I uh, thought, hmm, this isn't bad. You know, not, not a bad spot to, to nest and instead of Vermont, and it's much closer to the city, and my relatives, my mom, my grandmother, my uncle was all in, in, in New York. So uh, I decided to uh, start looking for a place to, to do my sculpture. Dorothy had her studio in, in um, Kutchog that she shared with Jan Swanson. And, um, Towards the end of the late 70s, when I came back and spent more time in the States, um, I, my sculpture started to grow. I was, I was previously doing some marble, some bronze, but I started to do some welded steel pieces. And I was, Dorothy was generous enough to share her studio with me. Um, but at a certain point, my sculptures got too large and I was squeezing her out and I had to look for a place to, to rent. I was looking at all these garage spaces and sheds, and all of them seemed to be uh, spaces that I had to do a lot of conversion and, and expense to change the electrical to 220, to put plumbing in. And then, uh, lo and behold, I looked at the Suffolk Times in the fall of 1980, and I see a barn for uh, sale very cheap on one acre, and it was described as, it was described as a potato barn. Now, a potato barn, barns are traditionally underground, and um, Jan and Dorothy didn't think I should take a look at an underground barn, but I thought, oh, what the heck, I'll go take a drive to Orient. And um, it was a huge space, 100 running feet long by 40 feet wide. And uh, the sort rain was coming down. Tumbling down, the rain was coming inside. Floors were falling in. But I thought, you know, there's nothing else that I saw that I could use as a studio. And this is the, here's a photo of some of the construction that was going on uh -huh, in the early uh -huh. 80s. 
So sometimes to follow your passion, you have to make certain compromises. So this isn't a really finished space, but you can see the potential, in other words. It's my and loft in the country. Your loft in the country. And were you building yourself, or did you hire contractors? How did you manage oh, to... Uh, some of the construction, some of the insulation, all the cabinetry in the kitchen I did. But this was major, major undertaking, and I needed someone to uh, tear down the walls. As you can see in the photographs, a lot of the walls, the interior walls, had to be taken at, down. And I uh, put up a lot of, lot of windows in the hallway, hallway that you. you mm. So this is a really monumental space that we're looking at here. We're what about 2,500, 3,000 square feet, and, and how high are the ceilings? Uh, about. 22 feet to the peak. Up until um, about seven or eight years ago, there was a huge sheet of plastic that was dropped over the ceiling to keep the heat down. And uh, I've slowly insulated the barn. I mean, some of the construction you were asking about, um, I wasn't, I wasn't able. Phases. I was doing it in phases. Each year, I would do something new because I, it was just really an enormous under, undertaking, and I didn't have a lot of money. I was. Uh, trying to put my money into my sculpture and just living. And as I could afford to insulate the space, I, I did. But in uh, 1983, um, I put a furnace in, but didn't want the heat sitting up at the peak of the roof. So I dropped this 40 square foot uh, plastic sheet to keep the heat down. And it wasn't until seven or eight years ago that we finally insulated the roof. And uh, I felt confident that you know a lot of the heat was staying in the barn and not going right out of the roof. But la just last year, I finally insulated the south wall. So now the, the building, after 24 years, is, is completely insulated. And now it's completely a home, uh, uh, guest accommodations with the mezzanine, which you added. And you're also, your studio is right yeah, here. Yeah. And you have an indoor as well as an outdoor studio. Well, that's true. Uh, it's sort of a three-season studio for, for uh, doing some of my bronze finishing, the, the grinding away, and the patinas I do outside. And I can do it just about any time, as long as the sun's shining, um, and it's not too cold, I can do patinas and, and uh, chasing and finishing of my, my bronzes outside. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And how did you start, you had mentioned earlier that when you had first arrived you were feeling a little isolated and a little bit alone. How did you start to uh, expand your base of meeting people and that sense you had mentioned to me about just a feeling of community? Well, when I first came here visiting Dorothy in 1976, she introduced me to a few friends, but uh, for a good number of years my base was in Italy. Um, I didn't really moved to the States until full time until I started teaching, which was in 1982. So between 76 and 82, I was pretty much based in, in uh, Pietro de Santa and would come back to New York and, and Dorothy and I had uh, winterized her place in East Marion at Bluefish Cove in 78, so I had that for a grounding. But um, in 1982, when I started teaching, I was offered a job at the Elizabeth Seeger School that um, Anne Mackay and Carol Losey and Cynthia Beer helped found. It was uh, finally uh, moved to Tribeca, where I was uh, founding a sculpture program. I uh, connected with other, other women from the North Fork once I, I had the, the teaching job. And uh, I'd spend one or two nights in the city and then come back to, to East Marion to, uh, to live. And I became friends with Jane Chambers, who uh, uh, was our playwright and who wrote Bluefish Cove. And around that same time, Jane became ill. And uh, uh, we started a little newsletter together in the winter of 82, and we called it 25 East. And I think that was the first time that there was this spirit of trying to build something connecting all the different uh, lesbians that had migrated to the North Fork. And that was, that was instrumental in my feeling a connection to, to the North And then was there a fairly large community out here at the time? It was or? quite small. It was quite small. And um, I would say by the, I don't know, maybe there was a mailing list of 100 women back in 1982, 100 women who were pretty constant residents here. 
And by the mid-80s, the community started to stretch, and there were many more uh, smaller parties or gatherings uh, during the summer. But when I first came here in the, the 1976, there really was a small, tightly knit community, and I think that's where I felt isolated. I think as the community grew, I felt more connected. And there were, there were younger women that were coming out here as well. So that was a... a go, go. So Marianne, tell us a little bit about the initiation of the beginnings of NUFWF and being a part of the founding board members of that organization. How did it start out? What was the structure of that? Well, it was very exciting. In the summer of 1992, uh, I, was, I was camping in the Adirondacks. And you were invited to my 40th birthday. Do you remember that? Yes, to go camping, yes. indeed. I spent, the, I spent the summer of 1992 uh, making art in the woods. I, I had decided, my uh, last year working in Italy was 1991, and I decided before I turned 40, I wanted to camp for the summer and, and have a, a studio tent. And during that uh, summer, uh, Jan was asked to put together a board, Jan Swanson, by Beva Eastman and Lucy Goodman. And uh, I got a sort of a relay message through Diane when she came up to visit me in the Adirondacks that I was supposed to be uh, one in of the touch. founding board members. In touch. And what was the purpose? <laughs> and I mean, what was the uh, inspiration? What was the spark for that? I mean, was there a need that suddenly had a well, here I, the think, North I think I think Beva and Lucy felt that if uh, they could do if, if they could have their dream wish that they would love to know that every lesbian on the North Fork had um, their health needs taken care of them that there wouldn't be a financial burden, burden on them and that and there would be something in the community that would be able to help assist, them afford right. appropriate uh, health care. And women could apply to a fund, a revolving fund, where uh, they could get assistance, financial assistance and support to uh, help them to, through a, a medical crisis. Well, so that summer I turned 40 and Jan was putting together a board of seven lesbians from the North Fork representing each of the decades from the 20s to the 70s. So here I had just turned 40 that summer in August of 92. So I was beginning uh, the uh, term of the 40s. And uh, Jan was the only one who was redundant of the 50s. I think Carol Marcus uh, represented the 50s, and Lucy Goodman represented the 60s, and Ginny Moore represented the 70s. Uh, Melissa Spiro was the 20s. She was like 28 years old. And uh, Claudia Slazik represented the 30s. So we were the original seven original board members. And, um, and I think you had one of the original large auction fundraisers right. where all the women in that's the community right. contributed various services it's and talents to be auctioned, and that was held right here in yeah. your in the courtyard. Uh, courtyard. Here. Yeah. The summer of 1993 and the summer of 1994, we had the two auctions here, and maybe 150 to 200 women showed up. And uh, it was just amazing. It was like an uh, old-fashioned church supper kind of event for lesbians. And we all did cooking on the grills, chicken, fried chicken and chicken on the grill. And, and it turned we, out to be a great fundraiser it was for a the organization. I think you were able to raise around thirty or $40,000 yeah. that first yeah. uh, time. And that sort of set a pace for North Fork. Yeah. Well, speaking of inspiration, um, and sort of as we conclude, tell us a little bit about the nurture in your life. Who, who do you see as the strongest influences that have helped you in your career? Well, I grew up with uh, a mother who was a painter, also an art educator, and uh, she greatly inspired me and, and supported me in, in, in the work that I do today, and uh, was rather non-judgmental. She really assisted me in, in the direction that I took. And my aunt uh, was also a sculptor. Uh, there are a couple of... There are several sculptures that my Aunt Meg made. This is a, in front of me, a serpentine stone carving of an owl. And behind me there's a terracotta head that she made in the late 40s. 
and uh, I grew up with stone carving. She uh, worked in France a good part of her life, my father's sister, and uh, inspired me, was very supportive of uh, These stone were carving. Part of your French relatives? Yes, my they? father's family. Uh -huh. yep. uh -huh. And did they, at the time, did they know that you were gay? Tell us a little bit about when you sort of made those early discoveries, um, that you were a little different from everyone else. Well, I felt I was gay in high school and had mad crushes on classmates, still friends with some of those crushes. And it wasn't until I was a student at Goddard that I acted out on my, my uh, passions. And, uh, really wasn't an issue with my mother. She, um, she just accepted me, as I said before. She was non-judgmental. Mm -hmm. She visited me in Italy, met Dorothy in Italy. Came, when when uh, I came to the States and lived out in East Marion, my mom would visit. She loved my friends here. She loved Jan. Jan was terrific, embraced my mother. and My mother became friends with Pepper and Edna. Every time she'd visit us, she'd visit with them. And it turned out that Pepper Wheeler uh, and my mother went to teacher's college around the same time, so they knew some of the faculty together. So it was a small world thing. My and it's interesting that it's you're interweaving all the different yeah. arts because Edna, of course, is a photographer. And uh, That's right. you're leaning toward all of the artistic members of this community. That's right. Is there a fairly large proportion of women out here that are representing the arts, would you um, say? Not that many, more more so now. I would say more in, edu well, when I first came out, more in education. Um, I say when I first came out to the New York Forum. Um, but I think today we have more professional women, architects, doctors, lawyers, um, bankers. And, and was it, would you profession? think that the community is embracing this fairly large um, population of gay women? Absolutely, yeah, yeah. There's a, a wonderfully diverse community here, but I think there are more creative types like yourself and Sandra. And uh, but uh, it's very difficult. It's a struggle to make a living as an independent artist anywhere, and they're really uh, the economy doesn't support it here. So you have to strive to figure out how to make a living here and do your art. And that's one reason why I don't think there is aren't very many artists living, living here. Well, today. you certainly led us on a wonderful path of how to survive and follow your passion. And I wonder if you have any advice for younger women uh, who also have this draw to create and to be artists. What would you advise them? I would advise them to keep their life simple, not to have a whole lot of like uh, worldly desires and to be focused and disciplined and keep your eye on the prize, your prize being your passion. And you know, it's, it's uh, very important to be disciplined about that because I always make the uh, analogy to a horse having blinders on to um, really not be distracted by the many dis distractions that the world has and uh, to, to focus on what you really find important and, and find passion. I think that's a wonderful place. I do too.